Welcome to today's episode of So What's the Catch? The usual crew is with you again today. And uh, where I don't know, what sport do you want to start with? It's not like some season got canceled or anything yesterday. I don't know what you're talking about. Baseball is dead. Look at the sign, people. And that's a dollar sign for the S in baseball, by the way. Oh, nice. Good call. <laughs> yeah, I heard about that too. Dead, and the MLB ownership is trying to make sure that it remains extinct and never comes back, apparently, because they are asking for the moon. Oh, what a complete cluster. Oh, greedy. It, this is so bad for the sport. It's so bad for fans. It's so bad for the players. It's, it's the worst for the minor league players that mm-hmm. are on the foot man roster. Because the the minor league players that aren't on the 40-man roster are eligible to participate in the minor league season. The guys that are on the 40-man can't play. They can't practice. They don't get paid. Yep. And for those who don't know, the first week of the season has officially been canceled. So Mm -hmm. that's where we're starting from uh, with this conversation today. Um, and let's be honest, like the state of baseball wasn't great leading up to these discussions, you know, like, no, it wasn't. It's uh, it's a, a sport that's been fading in America. Uh, the NBA's popularity has kind of surpassed uh, MLB, and it appears that NBA is the second favorite sport in America now by a long shot. Mm-hmm. Um, and baseball is more comparable to the NHL. You think even college football beats MLB? What do you say, Chuck? You think college football could be beating MLB? The ratings. Ratings wise, yeah, probably oh, the yeah. big games, big SEC games, rivalry games, of course, yeah. Yeah, ratings wise, I would say so. But the thing with you know college, me. the thing with college football is their season doesn't line up, doesn't line up perfectly with MLB. Like their season starts when the MLB season is kind of winding down, so they don't compete quite as much. I know. Like, I mean, th- they do kind of compete a little bit when baseball's oh, getting into the, the prime spot, the, you know, the best games when you get to yeah. the World Series. That's when college football is directly competing. And I can tell you right now, college football crushes baseball every single time. And yeah, that's the season we're talking about, James. Like, these are, these are the big matchups, you know. It's the premier teams. It's the premier players and uh, in the biggest games. So, like, regular season, early year, a lot of non-conference matches – are outperforming postseason MLB games before right. we out. And now look where we're at. Now we're looking at the first week of the season is officially canceled. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not looking like we're getting much closer to an agreement at oh, all. Yeah. So God knows how much of the season continues to be chipped away. Um, yeah, and then the owners throwing out these these rule changes with the larger bases and banning the shift and the pitch clock. It's like this isn't the time for that. It doesn't feel it's like not. it's not. I mean, they're, they don't want to play. The owners do not want to play in April. April is the least profitable month of all of baseball. You have mm-hmm. lots of cold weather games. You don't have people coming in through the gates. You don't have, you have like the initial, like maybe half a week where everyone's like, Oh my God, baseball's back. Then nobody gives a shit until the all-star game. Okay. A lot of injuries in April too. Mm-hmm. It's I mean, the, yeah. the owners would rather not play in April, then come to an agreement. That's, that's where we're at. And that's led to the situation we're at now. I mean, like it or not, baseball has been like the Titanic since like 94. Okay. This has just been one slow, almost 30 year sinking of the entire sport. Yeah. It's it's just not going to recover anytime soon. I mean, this is just making it worse. Uh, The 2020 discussions about how to resume their season, what ended up being the 60 game season was just like the appetizer for what this is. I mean, that was ugly. That was brutal. You already had uh, the accusations of not negotiating good faith then. And that's when the CBA wasn't even on the table. Okay. Right. And now we're here and we don't have baseball. And I have no idea when that's going to come back. Uh, I, I, I've said it before. There's been many times where I said that agents told their players, see you in June. Yep. Yeah. And to go off of what you were saying earlier, James, about how, like, owners don't want to play in April, well, if that's the case, just shave some games off the schedule altogether. Like, 
Like, I feel like 162 in itself is way too many games anyway. So, if you, yeah. so if that's the case, just start the season. I'm just making it more of a general statement. So, I get what you're saying. Here, here's the problem. Money. What the owners want is, in this scenario, is to shave off those games and not pay the players or anyone for those games. What would actually uh-huh. happen is the the money that they're getting paid per you know game or week or whatever, what have you, that number would increase over the period of time. They just don't want to pay that first month. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. that's where we're at. It seems and, like they and, don't and, care about the well beings of their player. They don't. They don't. That's a fact. They don't. And this isn't the first work stoppage <laughs> in our lifetime, James. Like the the ninety four situation was terrible for the game. And let's be honest, the steroid era, era resuscitated baseball. Baseball was on the verge of death before uh, the steroid era resuscitated it, luckily. Um, it's going to take something similar <laughs> to dig baseball out of the grave that they find themselves in now, um, considering Another the steroid cycle era. What's that? Another steroid era? I, I'm not saying that. that I'm just saying it's going to take some really good baseball to really bring people back. A lot of exciting high-level play uh, that's going to be needed to bring uh, people back. And to anticipate that after a work stoppage when people aren't playing consistently. And um, it's usually not a good product when you run into stuff like this. So I don't anticipate some kind of revival of baseball happening like it did in the 90s. I don't either. And when baseball does come back this year – if you remember what happened in 2020, a lot of guys got hurt. Mm-hmm. A lot. Okay. And so you're going to see the same thing again. You're going to see a lot of guys suffer major injuries, and it's okay. going to suck. You're going to see torn ACLs. You're going to see torn rotate, rotator cuffs, torn UCLs. And, and any injury you can possibly imagine that's major in season ending will happen. Yep. 100%. Yeah. And it's crazy because, like, the pro- one of the biggest problems baseball has in general, you know, Brian, you know this. Like, I don't like to see the same teams winning it every single year. It feels like in baseball, it's always going to be the Dodgers, the Yankees, the Red Sox, any of those really big market teams, except for your occasional Kansas City Royals, that the run that they had from 2014 to 2015. Mm-hmm. Or what the Tampa Bay Rays did in 2008 and their subsequent playoff runs. But generally, you don't see those small market teams. It's, like I said, the Yankees, the Dodgers, San Francisco, I would play in that. Um, big I mean, market. they were winning the World Series every other year for a decade almost. <laughs> right. Yeah. So- I mean, what you're saying like baseball does lend itself to those runs that Kansas City team, like that team like Kansas City has, or a team like that Tampa team has. Like it does lend itself to those type of runs. But if you're talking about any sustained success, like, uh, like let's say the Braves in the '90s, like if that kind of success is not had by small market teams anymore, like it just—that's what I'm saying. Right. If we if there is success in a small market team, we applaud it and talk about parity and this and that. Usually the next year, they don't even make the postseason. Exactly. So it's like, yeah, even if you get to the top of the mountain, it's Mm -hmm. short-lived. And that's part of the problem, too, because look how quickly Kansas City's team uh, fans have tuned them out. You know, like the Chiefs are the king of that town. um, Mm -hmm. And they just won a World Series not long ago. So, Yeah, seven years ago. Right. Uh, I will say the last time we've had a repeat champion of baseball is all the way back in 2000 when the Yankees finished their three-peat. So mm-hmm. while the usual teams are usually in the postseason, we've had a different winner every year. Sure, it's there's been the every other year with the with the Giants or whatever, and you know the Cardinals won their fair share as well. But it's it's not re- like we're seeing just repeat, repeat, repeat. It's not like when we saw the Warriors win three out of four, or the yeah. oh go, went, went back to back, or the Lakers, or you know the Bulls in the '90s when they did the repeat, three peat. I mean that's just not happening. Or, or how about the Pistons every year? I mean, the, the Pistons went to two in a row. Then they went yeah. to three in a row. Like They won once, but they were in the finals for a few years. Uh, they were in the, the NBA finals in 04 and 05. They won 04 and lost 05. And then they were they were in the finals back at the end of the 80s before they won their back-to-back before the Bulls won three in a row. Right. And then wow. you had the Lakers from 2008 to 2010 where they lost in 08. 
but one in 2009 and 2010. But but that's, that's my point, really, is that we're not seeing stuff like that. We're not seeing runs like that. Sure, you're seeing a lot of teams over an extended period of time make multiple appearances, but that's going to happen in every sport. One team's yeah. going to make multiple appearances. Yeah, yeah. And um, the NBA, it's been more like it's been weird. It's like all teams all over the place. I like it. I mean, it is over the last couple of years, sure, but, but I mean, same we're, with not, we're not far removed from four straight years of Cavs Warriors. Let's be real here. Right, right. Uh, All right, we're not. That's but, something you'll never see in baseball. You'll never see this no. too. So yeah, baseball does lend itself to parody naturally more. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I but mean, you might you also have what we're talking about, Josh, where it's like you have a small market team like Kansas City win a World Series, and then they basically forget about the team within a number of you know less than five years. Exactly. And or now they're back to being a, a small market, you know, poor attendance. I mean, they get better attendance than we do, but like for a team that just won a championship, like not that long ago, you would think that they would sustain that for at least a little bit, but they haven't. Right. That's the problem. Like, you know, I don't like you at Philadelphia. They won the world series in 2008 and went back to the world series in 2009. Mm-hmm. And they haven't been able to really do anything since then. Uh, yeah. Real quick, Brian, uh, the Rays are one of the teams that have worse attendance than Cleveland. Um, oh, really? Yeah, they're one of the few. There aren't many. There Incredible. are not many. Incredible. Uh, only a couple. But. Yeah, and they just, you know, not too long ago were world champions. And we haven't been there since 48. So <laughs> that's kind of impressive that we have better attendance than them. Yeah, the fact that the Rays were in the World Series back in 2020, um, although they came up short in that World Series bid, they have not won a World Series yet. Um, right. but, How do we feel about playoff expansion? Do, do we want to get into that? Because, I mean, it, it looks like that's obviously a big point of contention right now. So um, they, so the what they wanted to do was they wanted to go to the 14-team format like they had in 2020 – and uh, the players, if I understand this right, said, no, we're not going to do that. So they compromised and agreed on 12. And that's to do what you and I are saying, Brian, where it's like you get it makes games in September and October meaningful for teams like Tampa. OK, maybe Tampa Bay is not a great example right now, but bubble teams. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think baseball has another big problem, too, of its star players not getting on the biggest stage. You know, you, you Mike, look Trout. At like Mike Trout. Exactly. So expansion, you know, I'm pro expansion in a way just because I, I would love to see a guy like Mike Trout in the postseason. You know, like in the NBA, we see all the best players in the postseason. Um, and I think that's good for the game. Um, so I think some level of growth would be good. But I think 14 teams like to go from what we're at now to 14 is just. It, it, it's a dramatic change and it, it almost changes the entire league, you know, not just the postseason. It, it, it's a, it's an entire different landscape with a 14 team playoff. It so, waters down the field a little too much. It, like the problem is like, I agree with you. Like it allows for put the star players who are on like just 500 teams or maybe just above to possibly get in and be like oh Mike Trout is actually in the playoffs or you know and any other guy in that discussion but at the same time it's like are we really getting the best teams in though I mean record wise sure but I mean here's what I'll put I'm pulling up last year's standings okay so we can see six versus seven you know who would be in Okay, because I think that's an important discussion to have because, one, there's a very real possibility that if you had six in, that you would have four teams from the AL East in the playoffs, okay, which is ridiculous. Okay, same for seven. So I'm looking right now, uh, yeah, if there were – if there were six, te- there were twelve teams, six for each league last year, we would have the Rays, Red Sox, Yankees, and Blue Jays in the playoffs. Wow. That doesn't fix anything. That just makes – it just adds another team. This is the same problem that we have. If we expand the playoffs in you know college football, where you just add another SEC team. Okay, you're yeah. just adding another team from a dominant group of players or group of teams. You're not you're not inviting teams like uh, you know Cleveland or Kansas City or the Mariners. You're just inviting another team that's really good from a division that otherwise missed the playoffs. I mean, yeah. 
Good point. Does this make anything better? I mean, let's be real here. Last year, they would have been, they would have had a, a better case for that in the National League, where the 83 and 79 Reds would have made it and the 82 and 80 Phillies. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, the 91 and 71 Blue Jays missed the playoffs last year. So did the 90 and 72 Mariners. That's heartbreaking. That yeah. sucked, but that's just how it is. I mean, that's baseball. Yeah. That's always that's been accepted that that's part of the game. Like, Win 100 games if you want to make sure you're in the postseason. Yeah. Pretty much. Win your division or win 100 games, especially yeah. if you're in the, the AL East. But the, the bigger problem here, and this is from a tweet I shared with you guys yesterday, uh, is that ESPN already sold the playoff rights, or sold, MLB sold the playoff rights to ESPN based on the 14-team format. So they backed themselves into a corner already, and so they're not willing to budge off of 14 teams in the playoffs. Which sucks. It's just – and that's just bad business, you know. That's very bad business. That's a, that's a very bad procedural. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Having a deal in place, not agreed to, but like, hey, if we get this and this is the format, we want you to do it. That's one thing. But like, it sounds like they already got everything done and, you know, they just need to get everything else. They went backwards. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Right. They, went, yeah. they went backwards to forwards. That's, yeah. 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 And that's, that's where we're at right now. So they're trying to get 14 teams because they already sold. The rights based off of 14 teams, and that's just the wrong way to do it. But here we are. Yeah, I mean, like I said, they ended up, excuse me, agreeing on 12 to as a compromise, I guess. But still, at the same time, it's like, again, yes, you're getting like the all star players that you want in, in. But at the same time, are you really getting the best teams in? I don't mm -hmm. think so. I mean, you're, you wouldn't even got Mike Trout or Otani in the playoffs last year, okay? And that's the and that's what we're trying to argue. You're trying to do, and they wouldn't yeah. have been, they wouldn't have made it, okay? So and, that that argument's out the window. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so yeah. you you also look at some of these other teams, like sure, like if you really like baseball, you can name players on the Blue Jays that aren't Vladdy Jr. But not many can. Yeah. yeah, that's the problem. You're, you're not going to have this conversation with someone. They're going to bring up Kevin Biggio or Lourdes Gurriel Jr. Okay, no. that's just not happening. Not, right. not with a casual fan at all. No. no. Like the four of us are like baseball fans, so we know our stuff. Mm -hmm. But not like – really mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, well, three of us. Okay, so three of us then. There we go. But, uh, like, if you go up to the casual baseball fan that isn't a diehard fan, they're not going to know, like, Albert or Almora Jr. off the Cubs. or Right. They're not going to know half of the players on the Guardians. <laughs> the not, even a, not even, not even a Bieber? Uh, people in town don't know half the players on the Guardians. Come on. They know Jose Ramirez, Shane Bieber, and nobody else. That's, That's Bieber, Bieber, Shane yeah. Bieber. The Guardians should be five games into spring training right now. Yep. It's uh so we're you like yeah, we're focusing on just the regular season, but like it, it takes a month for these guys to get ready, at least. You know, at least right. a month. For, for, so, for pitchers, it's like six weeks. Exactly. Two That's weeks. why pitchers and catchers always have reported early because it mm -hmm. takes them longer. So you're pushing that process back too. Um, I assume they're gonna shorten spring training, if not do away with it completely. I don't know what they're planning on doing. They're going to have to give some teams exhibition games of some kind, mm -hmm. whether or not they take place in Arizona and Florida, well, you know, that remains to be seen, but yeah, like it's, it's a big problem. I don't, I don't think we're going to see in baseball play for quite some time. And here's the other part of the equation is like for a lot, for a lot of baseball fans opening day is like supposed to be like, this like holiday mm -hmm. where it's like, Oh, opening day is here. Springtime is like when baseball season starts, that usually signals like the official start of spring in. Yeah. yeah. Americans have always associated baseball with the spring. Once mm -hmm. pitchers and catchers report, people are like, okay, we know that the weather's about to break. It's getting. Cold. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's like, everybody's in action and, just like on opening day for any sport, it's like, oh, we have a clean slate. Like everybody thinks they have a chance at the, going to the World Series. 
Obviously, we know some teams have no chance, uh, like the Pittsburgh Pirates. But <laughs> yeah, they're a dumpster fire. Yeah, but my overall point though is like you're for the baseball purists, you're taking that out. Mm-hmm. They're probably going to cancel Jackie Robinson Day, where I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll move, it. They'll, they'll move they'll, it. Yeah, they'll move it to a different day. It just won't be on the planned day. Uh, right. Like, like that's right. 2020 with the 60 game season, they had a Jackie Robinson Day, even though it wasn't on the typical Jackie Robinson Day date. Yeah, right. that's what, what I meant is like not playing it on the traditional date. I mean, that's just that's just what they're going to have to do, I guess. I mean, it, it's right now, I think they would be starting. Uh, the, like the day a, is kind of arbitrary too. It's more yeah. about the, you know, the tradition of it is about something bigger than that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't think that moving it off the official date really takes anything away from it. Um, but I, I get what you're saying. Like it's yeah, it's a bummer, but yeah. And like the other part is, I want to say it was going to be like a significant anniversary for Jackie Robinson Day. Like I think I heard that it was good. That April 15th this year was going to mark the 70th anniversary of mm-hmm. him breaking the color barrier, if I remember correctly. Uh, I'm Googling uh, currently. Uh, hold on. Don't quote me on that one. Okay. April 15th was opening day in 1947, Robinson's first year in the major leagues. I have an interesting thing to share with you guys that I've just kind of observed while I'm looking through the Indians guard. I'm sorry, the guardians roster. Um, there's only one player over 30 years of age on the active roster right now. Very wow. young team, a young team, very young team. So you're talking about when you're talking about like a season being Who's over 30? Uh, the only person over 30 is going to be, I just saw it. Uh, Anthony Gose. Anthony Gose. Okay, okay. Former uh, former outfielder for the Tigers, converted into a flame throwing left handed reliever out of the bullpen. Is, is it Gose or Goes? It's Gose. Goes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's the only one over thirty that uh that's on the active roster right now. So young team. Spring training is super important for a young team and a young organization. So like the Guardians. I mean, this was never going to be a great year for us. No, but I would argue that we're going to be one of the teams that suffers the most out of oh, absolutely because there's there's a lot of uh, there's a couple key roster spots to that need to evaluate this season. Spring training's a an opportunity for them to do that. You know, mm-hmm. most notably the first base position and who the hell's playing first base this year. Right. Um, you know, then you look at the outfield. There's some positions that they've needed to try and figure out for the past I don't know five years that they failed to do so. Yeah. And there are guys that are on, they're essentially up against it where like it's make it or break it time, Bobby Bradley. Okay. Yeah. So I was just about to say, Bobby Bradley, they're going to shove him down our throat at first base another year. Yeah. Or and, Yu Chang. Uh, God, yeah. no, no more Yu Chang. Oh, and man. then, I mean, you don't know what the hell's going to happen with Nolan Jones. I mean, Nolan Jones's stock has plummeted since from a couple mm-hmm. of years ago. He was very highly thought of just a couple of years ago, you know, pre COVID, but he has since cratered in the stock department. And Big he, time. Is, he is not. He has not uh, looked upon well as as, uh, as highly regarded as he once was. Right. So that's also another problem is trying to figure out how he's going to fit into this whole thing. Then sounds like Jordan Love in Green Bay. <laughs> there's the gajillion uh, middle infielders that they have and how they got to sort that out. And I mean, that's before the fact that, that shortstop right now. I mean, that's before the fact that you have to acknowledge that with the Guardians not playing games, with the sh- season being shortened, with not having the minority owner in place because that can't happen right now. I mean, what's the likely possibility where we're not even going to see Jose Ramirez on this team this year because of this. Right. And the other part of the equation is like, you know, they just, they just rebranded to become the guardians with the new logo, which a five-year-old could have drawn something better than what they came up with. But still, um, and it's like when you go through a, as significant of a rebrand as they did, you want that full season so that people can seemingly get excited about it. I understand what you guys are saying overall about how like after the first week, the the joy and all that would have 
gone away. It was more like a nationwide comment about how people like stop paying attention to baseball intently after about three or four days. But in, in, in Cleveland, after opening day, game two was sparse for attendance. Let me tell you that because uh, I went in 2019 to opening day, then then game two, and if there were if there was like five thousand people there, I'd have been surprised. There used to be a real high demand for opening day tickets in Cleveland. Real high. And not opening day, I mean the whole series. That, oh, that yeah. first series used to be impossible to get tickets for. Oh, yeah. And now, I mean, they're they're doing everything to get people there. You know, I, I, I buy the cheapest upper deck seats, and I stand over in the corner because nobody's there. Okay, yep. Because they're cheaper. The upper deck seats that are like last row are cheaper than buying the standing room only ticket. Yeah, I'm a I'm a home run porch guy. I'm a home run porch guy, so I just get the cheapest ticket I can buy, and I go watch the game on the home run porch. Uh, that's my spot. I've always watched from there. Mm-hmm. Got my hands on a couple foul balls over there. It's fun. I like being over there. So I, I use the same same strategy. I just get the cheaper upper deck seat because it's cheaper than the standing room only ticket. Yeah. So. Um. Usually, I like to be in the outfield along the. I think it's right field side. Yeah, right field by the bullpens. Yeah. They just switched the bullpens around out there in Cleveland too. Yeah, they're yeah. like they're like almost set, like dead center now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I like I, I like having the bullpens like right in the middle of the crowd like that. It's cool yeah. to uh when you do have seats in that area, it's cool to watch guys warm up out there. I like Yeah. It. But but I agree with what your original point, like from when we started the show, Brian, that football has easily passed um, baseball. I think the NBA has surpassed baseball. If the NHL can get their shit together, they may actually have a chance at somehow passing baseball. But It's crazy to say, but baseball is becoming a niche sport to follow yeah it is it really is and it used to be the most mainstream easy sport to follow like listen on the radio in your car like it, it was just such a part of the culture and now it's like baseball fans are kind of few and far between like people who really watch the game and love the game and you know pay attention to the stats and play fantasy and all that stuff like it, it's becoming a really niche thing in this country and that's not good for the game Right. That's that's another point I wanted to make about this whole lockout in general is just like this is just bad timing for them to be debating a lot of the things they're debating. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, like there's stuff with the game that needs change and can get better and they can improve. But like, let's have the games at least being played before we talk about changing the rules. Mm-hmm. Right. And the other thing is like when they come back or if they come back at this point, they'll – they're going to lose the month of April because I don't see them getting a deal before April is done. No, nah, April. Uh, so at best, they'll be starting their season in May, which means you're going right up against the NBA playoffs. You're going right up again. I know hockey isn't as popular, but still you're going against the Stanley Cup playoffs. And I would say May – May to July is when people are starting to get into the football mindset. Like, cause they know that August and September is when the NFL comes back into play. So you got yeah. the draft coming up and then, you know, everybody's talking about rookie, ca- you know, mini camp and training camp. Exactly. Yeah. So like baseball, I feel like they, I agree with what both of you are saying. They really have backed themselves into a corner and unless they get some dramatic event like, you know, the Sosa McGuire home run battle, which whether you agree with how they got their home runs or not, it added excitement to the game. Mm. I can appreciate that. Still had to make contact with the ball. I'm gonna say. Exactly. Yep. That's why I'm saying I still appreciate it regardless. Mm-hmm. But Baseball needs something like that. I mean, like, I would say that the Astros scandal kind of did that for a period of time because people were hating the Astros left and right. And 
when they would come to like Yankee Stadium or something like the Dodgers or whatever. It was like, I need to see, watch this game. But, you know, that whole thing has worn off. And it's like, now what? Right. I, I will say with the, the delayed season, the one thing we're going to see is um, I shared this tweet from Jason Stark with you guys yesterday about the unbalanced schedules. Because back in 95, all the teams played 144 games, but their seasons were not symmetrical. And the examples he gave were that the uh, the Indians at the time played five versus the Angels, seven against the A's, uh, and nine against the Rangers and Mariners, while the Royals played 12 against the Angels, 13 against the A's, 14 mm-hmm. against the Rangers, and 12 against the Mariners. Right. So a, a similar schedule thing is most likely going to happen. With yeah. that. Again, the way they schedule games was entirely different than um, – I'm not sure when the central divisions got introduced into baseball off the top of my head, but I have a, I have a feeling it was probably around there. And that was when interleague play was only for like a month in the middle of the season. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, you know, I have no idea how much of an impact it will have, but that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah I, absolutely. Yeah. I, first of all, I like that interleague play is, not just in one month where it's like nationally. I liked it better. I liked it better like that. I did. Really? Yeah. I liked it better because, it, because it, with the way that the two leagues were different at the time, because now we're going to have the universal DH at the time you have one where the pitchers batted and one where the pitchers didn't bat. Mm-hmm. And so you're used to playing American league teams all the time. When you have that short period of time of interleague play, it gives you something new and different to look at. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kind of refreshes the season a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a little little palate cleanser, a nice little break, right? Yeah, there. and it kind of gives a little bit of pageantry too. You know, it's like the mm-hmm. ambiance of oh, it's interleague play. You know, it, it puts a spotlight on the game for a, a couple weeks. You know, or mm-hmm. well, back then it was a month, and I I, I did kind of like that too because it was like you could kind of plan your your baseball. You know, however many games you go to, like I always would plan on going to at least one of the interleague games. And now it's like, you look at the the schedule, you could go to an interleague game any time of year. And I don't know, it's, it kind of lost some of its luster when you do have an interleague opponent. Yeah. I understand that. The one cool thing that major league baseball is doing now is they're having like divisions play the entire division. So like this year, the AL central, is scheduled to play the NL West. The mm. only the only annoying part about it is like some against some teams you only play a two game series, whereas with the other teams in the division you play three game series. I I always hated the two game series. It for me they're pointless. Like okay, what? It's it's just a way to get games in. It's it's all that is. Is is sometimes you find yourself back into a corner when you're making a schedule, I guess, and you just gotta figure out a way to get games in. Be like, mm-hmm. okay, well, these two teams aren't playing. They need to be playing here. There's only a two day break where they can play, and you know, you usually have one team having an off day beforehand, the other team having an off day the other for a weekend because it's usually like a Tuesday, Wednesday, or a Wednesday, Thursday, two games, two game schedule. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. That's a good point. Too. So. Uh, one last thing on baseball before we move on to football. Okay. Um, something that I, I saw this morning that's on the, our, our show sheet here is that with the delay and if it continues, play high profile players such as Pete Alonzo and Shohei Otani will have their service time manipulated, which will delay them becoming a free agent by one year. Oh, wow. If it's 15 days of missed games, they'll have one more season to wait. Wow. That's huge. That's really So huge. If, if you're an owner, you know, maybe uh, not Steve Cohen, but maybe if you're the owner of the Angels, yeah, uh, you want to wait that extra year so you don't have to shell out big bucks for Shohei. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. That that makes a the world a difference for that mm-hmm. that team specifically. Yeah, I mean yeah. Steve Cohen just got like fuck you money, so he's just gonna yeah, he, doesn't yeah, he doesn't care. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. An extra year of you know care. extra time before you gotta pay up is a big, big deal. And that's what most of these negotiations have been about. It's been service time manipulation. That's been a lot, it's been a very key point. 
and the owners are going to find a way to manipulate service time one last time, possibly, before we even get a new CBA. Yeah. Yeah. So, shifting to football now, uh, Kyler Murray, he's not happy. No, he's not. And Come to for- Cleveland. <laughs> and yet- Come here. But That's before, all I got to say to that. But before we get to that part, what the hell is Arizona thinking? For some reason, they gave Cliff Kingsbury and Steve Kime extensions. What? Or, I, don't, I don't know what they're doing with that. They're tanking. Steve, Kime's, Steve Kime's been – he's overseen probably one of the more successful runs for the uh, – like before Steve Kime, they had like – I think four or ten win seasons in their history, and they've had six under him or something like that. It's something like that. I don't remember what it is. But they've had more uh, success under Kime. But Cliff Kingsbury, I don't think Cliff Kingsbury is all that uh, good as a coach. I think he's incredibly he's overrated. And I wouldn't have done this, especially when the you know the release by Kyler Murray's agent came out, which was incredibly lengthy. <laughs> And I understand where Kyler Murray is coming from to a point, but like, dude, you've, you haven't played well enough to be doing this really. I mean, he started no. fast in the past couple of seasons, but he's faded down the stretch. He's and then he had that, don't care. Uh, then he had his other yeah. playoff performance. Uh, it's just like, really, you're going to play this game now. Doesn't really seem all that wise. I mean, because what was the big knock on Kyler Murray coming out of college? It's his size, right? So what happens yeah. is that early on the season when he's very healthy and he hasn't been hit, he's fine. Then eventually the hits start to pile up and then he has more bumps and bruises and he can't perform well enough. That's where we're at. Right. And his numbers aren't at. bad. Huh? His numbers aren't bad. Okay, but he's, he's faded down the stretch two years in a row after starting incredibly red hot. Right. It's like not a coincidence. Jerk, look at this season. The Cardinals start off undefeated, like 7-0 and or 8-0, something like that. I remember that. And then what happened down the stretch? They lost to the Packers on a short week. They lost to the Colts on Christmas. They lost to the Rams on Monday Night Football. And then they, they lose in the, the wild chance. Card. They got crushed in the wild card by the eventual Super Bowl champion, L.A. Rams. It's happened countless times with Cliff Kingsbury as their head coach and Kyler Murray as the quarterback. Coincidence? Kyler should come here. I think not. I mean, the, the, we'll talk about the, the quarterback situation here in Cleveland a little later. You, but you don't think Kyler would be a good fit? No. I, I, I think Kyler's too small. Okay, he, he can make incredible plays, but I think he's too small. How you know what about Russell Wilson? Russell Wilson's taller than him, and he doesn't play the same way that Kyler Murray does. I think Kyler Murray's too small. I don't want to go from one short Oklahoma quarterback to another short Oklahoma quarterback who <laughs> down the stretch. To I just, a shorter, shorter Oklahoma shorter, quarterback. Shorter, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we've seen how big of a problem that's been for Baker. I mean, how many balls get tipped down at the line of scrimmage? Like, he's like tops in the league in that category. And here's the other problem. Like, we saw Kyler and Baker both win Heisman trophies. But think about what, A, what team they were playing for. B, who was the head coach? And C, what conference were they at? I'll give you the answers. A, Oklahoma, B, Lincoln Riley, C, the Big 12. It makes the quarterback look better than they really are by playing at Oklahoma with Lincoln Riley as the head coach mm-hmm. and playing in the Big 12. That more often than not, that's that's correct. I mean, there are exceptions to the rule, but it's it's usually a pretty good, good uh, rule to follow, by the way. But what this Kyler Murray situation really comes down to is he wants to – Secure his financial future now that he's extension eligible. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because that's what he is now. He can now sign a contract extension. And what he really wants to avoid is having a season like 
Baker Mayfield's this year for having uh, an issue where they simply can't come to an agreement on a contract, etc. What if he plays poorly? What if he suffers a season-ending injury in week one? Mm. Guess who has no leverage anymore? In contract talks. That's why he did this. That's why he wants to get it done now. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, that makes all the sense in the world, especially in a game like football. And especially for a guy who's on the edge of like being, you know, is he a guy or is he not? You know, he, he's kind of one of those guys on the bubble. And mm-hmm. uh, when you're one of those players, like, yeah, securing your financial future is like he feels that pressure right now. Um, he's in a very similar situation that Baker's in. So I, I think they're both acting very similarly based off of the same set of circumstances, really. Mm-hmm. If I had to pick, if you like put a gun to my head and said, you have to pick one quarterback to give a contract extension to, I guess I would go with Kyler because he's, I would say he's more athletic and you can do, I don't want to say quarterback draws, but we've seen Arizona do quarterback. Draws. You can do more with Kyler than you can with Baker and Kyler's ceiling is higher. I get exactly where you're going. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I would agree with all of those statements. Mm-hmm. You you have you have more options that you can go with, right? Offensively, it, uh, and so like between Baker and Kyler, yeah, I'd pick Kyler, but I wouldn't be thrilled about it either. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. No, you Neither would. would Neither would I. I mean, we, we've seen we've seen what happens when guys get hit a lot, and Kyler Murray gets hit a lot, they break down. Yeah, I mean. What was the – does anyone remember the conversations people were having five, six years ago about Cam Newton? Okay. RG3, and too. And you would say Cam Newton and, and, you know, this isn't sustainable. Everyone would just say, yeah. oh, you, you're, you're being a hater. What are you talking about? The dude's a shell of himself, okay? And he became a shell of himself shortly after that Super Bowl run. Yep. I yeah. Mean, well, he actually had some good seasons after that. Not really. No. Not really. He had like yeah. two. And before you say it. We don't care how many Pro Bowls. <laughs> he hasn't made a Pro Bowl since that Super Bowl. And, well, that and, makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> you could also put RG three in that discu- in that same discussion. Also, I mean, you can a little bit. His is more because uh, he had that ACL injury and he rushed back from it. Would, would you put that Johnny Manziel in this? Incredibly. What about Johnny Manziel? Why are we bringing him up? Apples <laughs> <laughs> oranges. <laughs> it, it's. The RG3 thing's a little bit different because he, he tore his ACL and he rushed back. I mean, if everyone remembers, it was that ready for week one campaign that he started. Mm-hmm. And yep, I you know what that. I mean? It, it just, he put himself up against it and came back earlier than he should have. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, honestly, all, all of that led to Kirk Cousins having a career. So I'm sure Kirk Cousins is kind of happy a little bit. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the same type of discussion is happening about Lamar Jackson right now because. He's in the he's the same type of quarterback. Yeah. Well, mm. Want to name a different type of quarterback, but someone in a very similar situation in terms of getting hit a lot is a guy down in Cincinnati. Um, he is getting absolutely destroyed in the backfield, and he's a guy that's already had a serious injury. Burrows. So, yeah. you know, that's one of those things that it's something to look at, you know, and something to consider. He's not obviously an aggressive as aggressive as a Cam Newton or an RG3 when it comes to running the ball, but he is a guy that's getting absolutely ate up in the backfield and taking a lot of hits, and we've seen that that can really shorten a quarterback's career. It does. I mean, even guys who aren't necessarily all that good, if they get hit a ton, mm-hmm. their, their careers are shortened. I mean, look at uh, look at David Carr when he got drafted by the Texans. He, yeah. got, and he got up, just ran over all the time. And, mm-hmm. I mean – I don't, I, I don't know if he has it anymore, but he had the like the single season record for being sacked. Yeah, and he, and he for the expansion car. What? I always keep thinking David Carr, if he wasn't drafted there, probably would have been a good quarterback. I, he might have been. I mean, we Maybe. had the same yeah. conversation about Tim Couch here. If yeah. He wasn't drafted here. Yeah, the, it's three years earlier we did the same you know same thing with tim couch it's just like you saw the same thing happen with the um with an expansion franchise in houston they drafted a guy and didn't put any offensive line in front of him and he got destroyed and it shortened his career and you know same with uh, andrew luck too that exactly happened to him i mean but he was not an expansion team though I mean, right he was on an established there were team. good players in place when andrew luck got drafted i mean yeah he was in a really good spot he wasn't for, protected that well 
I mean, sure, but he wasn't. He didn't have the you know Dave Wallabaugh and Jim Pine blocking for him. Okay, mm. <laughs> it's a little bit different than uh, than the expansion Browns team. Okay, mm. right. Oh my I God, agree. those names. What about Ryan yeah. Tucker? <laughs> yes, I remember Ryan Tucker. How or, about Ross Burba? Or, or mm. how about Jeff Fain? A one <laughs> Jeff Fain. Jeff Fain. Was he? Been, he was bad. Jeff Fain wasn't bad. Jeff Fain was not as good as Alex Mack. No, he wasn't as good as Alex Mack. That's fine, though. I mean, Jeff Fain was our, was a very good center. Then we decided that we wanted the Charles Bentley instead. His knees collapsed. He almost mm-hmm. lost both of his legs because of uh, because of staph infection. Yeah, sure, it was ended. Then, hey, okay. shout out my guy Hank Fraley too. That's my uncle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my uncle Hank. That either. I now I see why. You, are you related to him? Yeah, shout out to Uncle Hank. Hope you and the family are well. <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah, pretty fun fact. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what else we got on here in terms of NFL? You're joking. Uh, <laughs> you are joking. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, let's talk about this Garrett Wilson uh, situation. This is a good one because obviously being in Ohio, a lot of fans are clamoring for them to take either Garrett Wilson or a Chris Olave. And I thought, James, you, you pulled up a really interesting uh, uh, quote from Matt Bowen of ESPN, uh, his criticism of uh, Wilson, that he is loose within the route stem, um, yeah. which is a pretty important thing in the NFL for an NFL it, receiver. It, it is. It's very important. And, you know, it's OK if you're loose within the route stem. But if you remember, we had a guy on our team last year where they used a different descriptor of the exact same thing. And that word was freelancing. Mm. Okay. And that was Odell Beckham Jr. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And obviously Baker and him never got on the same page. I don't give a shit that Baker Mayfield played or thrown passes to Garrett Wilson before. Okay. I don't well, care. Nobody cares. I, I don't care. He threw passes to OBJ before OBJ was here too. Okay. That didn't mean shit. Yeah. So, I look at this, I'm like, okay, if you're going to stick with the same quarterback here, you you can't draft someone loose within the route stem as a descriptor yeah. of their ability as a route runner. And You're walking and, right back into an OBJ situation. Again. Yeah, exactly. So if you're going to stick with Baker, you need to find someone who's incredibly rigid in the route stem, does not deviate from the play as called because Drake that's London. the only way it's going to work. Yeah, I agree. Should we get him? Drake London is an interesting choice, Church, the receiver from USC. Yeah. So. Oh, you want to talk about Drake James? London? I don't want Drake London. Mm-mm. I do not want him. Um, well, I mean, short term, I'm concerned about his ankle. Okay. So his immediate yeah. contributions this season will be limited in one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Okay. One. Two. Uh, the dude has played primarily out of the slot. The Browns don't need a slot receiver. They need an outside receiver. What yeah, do we there you got one. I mean, who knows if Jarvis Landry is going to be here. All things pointing to no, but uh, they need an outside guy. Okay, mm-hmm. it, getting a slot guy does not solve the problems that they've had for the past couple of years. It, it, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. And this seems uh, kind of controversial to the whole the whole conversation. But I'm totally against drafting USC wide receivers. Sorry. What like, about Jameson Williams? I, I mean, I have concerns about his injury, but that's a different story. But I just, I, I don't touch USC wide receivers. I don't touch USC quarterbacks either. I, yeah, I don't I trust like USC. The, the, the fail rate on those guys is so high that you, you it's. I know you can't be like, actually USC linebackers are reliable, but that's about it. So we I have mean, other areas of need though that are that urgently need addressed, and in this draft, like the the deepest part of this draft is the, the guys up front, like the wide draft, receivers. It, no, no, it's it, like the offensive line and defensive line, like the front seven on each mm-hmm. side of the ball. Um, this is a deep draft for that. We have needs on on in both of those. Mm-hmm. So for me, I, in that first round and that second round, uh, do we have a second round pick? We have a second round pick, right? Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. To me, in those first two picks, you know, you might want to go with some of those guys, you know, because the, they're they're going to get better value in terms of uh, that level of pick than they were going to get with a receiver down there. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if they go for a wide receiver later in the draft, honestly, um, just because I don't think that any of these guys are a sure thing. Um, I think that the question is right. Wilson and, 
And same with Olave. Olave is a guy who's got a slight build. You know, he's not necessarily the best fit for the Browns right now either. So yeah. if you eliminate those two guys, you know, and then you also look at Drake London and, you know, the issues we have with him, I, I don't know that they necessarily are going to take a wide receiver there. I, I think it's very real possibility they go defensive end. Uh, yeah, me team. too. Um, and speaking of, you mentioned wide receivers late in the draft. Speaking of that, I have a hot take for you guys. Let's hear it. About a receiver a couple years ago the Browns drafted, Mr. One Donovan Peoples-Jones. Are you okay. ready? He's good. I, I have a couple for you. Okay, one. The production we will see out of Donovan Peoples-Jones will be very similar to what they got out of peak Rashard Higgins, okay? Which is not a lot. It's not very good. No, I One. agree with that. Two, if Donovan Peoples-Jones did not go to Michigan, he goes undrafted. Yeah, I mean, he, he didn't have a single 100-yard game at Michigan. He did. So, it, you so... get rid of that block M next to his name, and he goes to Indiana or something, or Purdue – he was a five-star recruit who never really lived up to his potential at Michigan. Um, he had an impressive draft combine, which again made him overrated, which happens to a lot of guys. Yep. Um, yeah, but he's always been a guy with an incredible amount of talent that hasn't really matched that with his production on the field. He, he's um, like a good, th- like maybe three receiver. Like no, he's a fourth receiver. Yeah, I, I said Rashard Higgins, and I stand by it. He's Rashard uh, Higgins. I think that's he's fair. He's not Rashard Higgins. I think he's better than Rashard Higgins. He's better, but the production you're going to get out of him is Rashard Higgins. Yeah, um, yeah. Production-wise, he's about the same. I think he's more Joe talented. Vicious. More gifted than Rashard. Joe Vicious has way more talent than and way more production than Donovan Peoples-Jones did. Yeah. yeah. I've been – once you said that, you made me think about it. Or uh, Keenan McCardo. So – I actually agree with you on that one. I mean, like, what do we, I mean, wh- wh- where's the production we're getting out of Donovan Peoples Jones? He's suddenly just going to become like this superstar guy. The other thing was he had 500 yards and three touchdowns. Okay. That's like what Rashard Higgins gives you on right. an average year, on, his, on a good year for Rashard Higgins, not an average year. An average year look, at, look at young receivers and the production that they're, you know, like, it, it, Look at Minnesota. Look at, you know, the, the young receivers in the league and Jamar Chase. I mean, these guys are getting 14, 1,600 yards their first and second year in the league, and we're talking about three touchdowns and 500? I think Peoples I Jones mean, is a project. About? I think he could be good, like, within, like, five years from now. That's okay. not, who cares? That's eternity in the NFL. It is so long. It is yeah. so long. You, we can't sit here and wait for this guy to, no. to be it. I mean, the, the reality is – if the Browns move on from Jarvis Landry, which is instant gratification so much. That's sure. the way the NFL works, man. I don't know how to tell. I, I hate to break it to you. Okay. And we've been putting off winning for 23 years now. Like, I'm done with putting off winning. And the- I feel like, <laughs> okay. Sorry, but that strategy's dead in Cleveland. Like, yes. we've been doing that for decades. And newsflash, Chirk, the Buccaneers and Rams have shown you the new blueprint to winning in the NFL. Because Yeah. And that's kind of a good segue into this uh, Browns plan to build like an expansion team uh, for Andrew God. Barry. Um, I, I hated that comment. Yeah. <laughs> because because it doesn't it apply. Apply. Comment, that comment you just made is one Andrew Barry would go, yeah, what Shirk said. Why you guys always want instant gratification? Uh, <laughs> like an expansion <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the Browns have needs all of the roster, but they have several foundational pieces in play that you can't that just what I did build say. like an expansion team. You have to have you have to have things kind of focused in an area or two of we need to address this position or position group. I agree. To talk yeah. about building like an expansion team as if they're starting. I wanted to say scratch. something like that. That's what that's what Andrew Barry said. They they built like an expansion team. Uh, yep. I didn't say something like that, did I? No, no you didn't. But... Saying that's what Andrew Barry said. <laughs> that's what Andrew Barry said. You're not Andrew. Yeah. Barry. Yeah. Um, like five six years ago when they were zero and sixteen and one and fifteen and shit. Yeah, you can do that because this team was devoid of talent. Okay, right. you you were an expansion team essentially. Yeah, like Hugh Jackson not... kept saying on the radio we were a talented team every single. Week. He's an ass clown. But anyways, you, you look at the, the the team. They have Miles Garrett. They have JOK. They have you know Denzel Ward. Greg Newsom looks really good. I mean, that's just a handful of guys I mentioned immediately on defense. That's before they got the offense, where you have Cole Antonio, 
You have, they have uh, uh, White Teller. You have Nick Chubb. You have Harrison Bryant. Those are all foundational guys to build around. Yeah, 100%. But not Njoku? No. I mean, he's, he's, on, he's, on, the, he's on the the list of things to talk about today. Don't you worry. <laughs> or uh, or uh, Austin Hooper? I think Austin Hooper's gone. One, One of them's got to be gone. You know? I don't even get Austin Hooper and overcharge him that much. Like, there was a reason he was doing productive, and it was because he knew that contract was coming. Once we gave it to him, he was done. The, the reason why he was productive, I can answer this, is because he was in a more pass-happy offense in Atlanta and had a superior quarterback in Matt Ryan. Okay? Yeah, I could have told you that. Kevin Stefanski has not utilized Austin Hooper in the same manner that he was used in Atlanta. They kind of like a very similar – even though they're in a very similar on the team. system. He feels what was that? on the team. I, I mean, he I, 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 I don't know. But it, here's what I'll tell you. is that while they ran a very similar offensive system in Atlanta, it's different enough to, that where Austin Hooper's catch opportunities are not at the same rate. They're not. No. I mean, but that's the problem overall with this offensive system. It's very run happy, run centric, run happy, whatever word you want to use there. So fine if you're if you're run centric, okay, that's fine. It's fine if you're based off everything off of the run, off of similar looks. What you need to do is if you're running an offense like this, is be efficient in the passing game. And, and they're not. Exactly. And it needs to be you need to be able to get good production out of their quarterback, and they really haven't. I mean, I, you need I don't to be care, a good but, game manager to, to run this type of offense, and Baker's not even good at game managing. He's, so. he's not even that. And, you know, Brian, you had your run in with C, uh, Pith yesterday of, uh, you know, talking about uh, Baker Mayfield's uh, ability. Okay. He was never a top 10 quarterback over an entire season, he wasn't a top 10 quarterback over half a season. Okay. Right. How, how do you feel about there. his combine video that I sent you? Who gives a shit about his combine video? That was five years ago. Again, the reason... why did they say quick feet work? That feet, feet work and athleticism are not the same. Right. I, I told you this in, in the Instagram. To quote Shaquille O'Neal. What? I, I I don't know what comparison that is. Okay. I, no, I was but, I said feet work. That was. <laughs> oh oh oh. Right. Oh. Having good footwork is not the same as being athletic. Okay. Yeah. It, I can look at how quick he passes good, but... too. I mean, that, that's a combine. He doesn't have anyone coming in at him. There's no, there's no, there's no rushers. Gym shorts and shit. You know, it's like it's. Okay. I, I would look good at a, at, a, at a combine. There's no one rushing <laughs> at me. I get to take my time, and there's nobody covering a receiver. If you if you look bad, that's more of a a, a red flag than somebody looking good as a positive. Okay, right. That's and the way you... to evaluate the combine. Is somebody incredibly bad? That's when you get concerned. You're not going there for positives. You're going there to look. For negatives, okay. You should play That's tag football. Way. Then. This is the proper way to scout players. You don't sit there and try to put together a list of this guy can do this, this, this. No, you start with the what can't they do. Okay? That's true. You, you play yeah. flag football. What can't they do? You will learn more about the player than if you sit there trying to fi- figure out what he can do. I, and Turk, here's the other thing. Remember what I football. said, Turk. Remember what I said earlier about how quarterbacks who have come out of Oklahoma recently have only looked good because of Cliff King or. Not Cliff Kingsbury, sorry. Lincoln <laughs> Riley, Oklahoma, and Big 12. Same logic applies to Baker Mayfield. The only reason he won Heisman Trophy and looked good at Oklahoma is because Lincoln Riley, he played at Oklahoma, and he was in the Big 12. If yeah. he tried, if he played in the SEC his whole career – he wouldn't have been, won the Heisman. He wouldn't have even been a Heisman finalist. Nobody would have even been talking about him. It, that's the that's the fact of the matter. He's a bum. I, I don't. I, I'm. I wish that we could just move on from him, so we don't even have to talk about him anymore. It's just exhausting. It's like, what? Is, what good is there to say about this guy at this point? Thank Thank you. You. What he, he he can he can fire up a team. He went. He went to the playoffs. So what? He's the best quarterback of the Browns franchise. No, what? That's false. Damn much. That, that I mean. That, that that number one. That's false. Uh, right. If you want to say uh, post ninety nine, I, I can maybe entertain that conversation. 
Mm-hmm. Because that's, that's where we're at now. We're not at the definitive best since 99 anymore. I'm sorry. We're that's not. like you walking into a kindergarten class and bragging about being the smartest one in the room. I mean, or, or, you know, when, when Bally, Billy Madison won the dodgeball <laughs> match in the movie, Billy Madison. Okay. That's a fair comparison as well. I, oh. it, you kicked the shit out of some, what was it, first graders, kindergartners yep. Yep. for that. But, I mean, let's be real here. I mean, if you want to talk about better quarterbacks in Browns history than Baker Mayfield, I have three right off the top of my head. That's Bernie Kosar, Brian Seif, and Otto Graham. Okay. And it's Ooh. not even close. Yeah. Okay. And there, I'm sure there are more along the way that were better than he was. Testaverde even. It, yeah. Yeah. You put Testaverde over him? Oh, hell yeah. Yes, I would take many Testaverde over Baker. You put Testaverde. I would. Okay. I would take the. Wait. The 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 Vinny Tester replaced Vinny Kosar, where that Vinny Tester wasn't even that good at that moment in time over current Baker Mayfield. Okay. Yep. Okay. Wait. What about Brian Hoyer? Would you put him over Baker? There's a conversation to be had there, I think, uh, especially in this particular offensive scheme that they run because it's <laughs> this it's very similar. It's a direct yeah, it Brian Hoyer ran. Okay. Um, good point. But if we're looking at other team? other quarterbacks who were better or than Baker Mayfield was, I mean, you can look at Kelly Holcomb. You can look at uh, Derek Anderson. Derek that Anderson. Great great time. Great yeah. You know what I mean? It, you, there's, a conversation about, over Baker. there's a conversation about Brian Hoyer that can be had. But it, it's not as just clear cut Brian or Baker Mayfield is better than everyone else since 99 anymore. It, that doesn't right. Having that conversation is nonsense. So, and here's so you think the, he's not no longer number one in that list of the nine? No, no. It, it, there's a conversation to be had about where he sits. It, it's not as clear cut as everyone tries to make it out now and tries to make it out uh, a couple of years ago. And here's he, my being the only one to win a playoff game gives him way more credit than he deserves. Right. He won a playoff game too. That's what so, I just said. Being the only one to win one since we came back gives him. I mean, that's the only argument for him, really, is that he won a playoff and, game and none of those guys did. So, And when and he won that my, playoff game, he was kind of sloppy at the end of the second quarter. He was, like, playing he bad. He was. I mean, that, that's right. But, I mean, let's be real here. Uh, the defense helps take him out to a 28 nothing lead by yeah. getting turnovers. But you know, someone to blow it, that's the Baker. The first play of the game. And then Ben Roethlisberger managed to become an interception machine early on, early on in the game, which gave the Browns uh, advantageous field position. Okay. Then, yeah, when, when the circumstances are perfect, Baker can do okay. No, Baker was even bad in that game. He still wasn't good. He was like bad in the second half. Right. Aren't you the one trying to defend Baker Mayfield right now? Too? No, what's happening? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, my biggest problem though with the Browns throwing curveballs. That's what's happening. My biggest problem with the Browns, not just with Baker Mayfield, but just in general, they try to put a square peg in a round hole where, like. They don't develop their offense around what the quarterback can do well. They're just like, hey, here's the offense. Don't care if your skill set fits it or not. Go run it anyway. And it's like, well, that's not going to get you jack shit. Well, the problem is, is that Baker doesn't have the skill set to run any NFL. He, he really – he has he struggles across the board. But if there's an offense that Baker Mayfield is going to succeed in, it's this one. Okay. We saw him play well for half a season underneath Kevin Stefanski in 2020. Okay. Mm-hmm. This is the only version of an offense where Baker Mayfield's going to look successful. We, we've seen him in various offenses, and he is significantly better in this than when we saw under the uh, Freddie Kitchens experience. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Again, I'm just talking it. about yeah. in general, not specifically and Baker Mayfield. Baker, I mean, that goes for every NFL team, though. That's not a player specific. either. He's not going to take a surgery. Okay. Right. You said that goes for every NFL team? The, no, the, the teams making players do what they can't do. I mean, that goes for every NFL team, and teams are more lenient now, and they're less rigid about their offensive philosophies than they were even 10 years ago. Um, oh, yeah. They're, they're a lot more open to doing more things. I mean, you, you look at guys like Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert, they would have been stuck in – Pro style I formation drop back offenses just ten years ago. Yep, and they would have and you would have said, "Run it." I don't care what it is. I don't care what you're doing. This is what you're going to do. I don't care what you're better at. You're doing this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I mean. So it, it, there, it's gotten better, but I mean NFL teams across the board have, have, have failed repeatedly at 
uh, trying to get quarterbacks to work. Yeah. I feel like going off, staying with Patrick Mahomes for just a sack, I think the Kansas that Andy Reid and Eric Bieniemy actually need to rein him in a little bit because I feel like he's gotten gotten into this mindset where, like, he ha- he can make any play, any time, whatever. And it's like, no, that's not how it works. Like, look at what happened on that on the final play of the AFC Championship with five seconds left. Why are you throwing a backward pass to? Tyreek Hill. And from what I've heard, it was Mahomes who convinced who convinced Andy Reid to go for it on that fourth down. So it's like Yeah, that was that was what Mahomes, that's what he came out and said after the game. But w- what I'll tell you is this. Uh, as far as Mahomes and the the issue that they're having in Kansas City is that a lot of teams are playing um deep deep coverages, forcing them to throw shorter passes. Okay. Uh, What makes Kansas city so electric and so amazing is that when teams don't run like cover four against them or quarters that they're able to complete passes down the field. But Mm -hmm. when they face that quarters coverage um, that takes away the deep ball, which makes Patrick Mahomes have to throw lots of check down passes and it's not as exciting and forcing teams to put together drives like that is, if you don't have a, a defense that forces turnovers, that's the ideal way to go about it. I mean, if you got to force them to do put multiple plays together over and over again. And yeah. go on those 10, 11, 12 play drives because it's hard to do. Yeah. I see a little bit of what you're saying though, Josh. There's, there's an element of like street ball to his game that appears in moments where, you know, the, the game is a little bit bigger than that. You know, like some of the, the, the sidearm throws or the, the no look passes, like sometimes they come at moments where it, a more conservative approach is called for. And I think that that's based basically off of him just being so damn good for the start of his career. You know, he's had so much success in this league, like in a way that, you know, most young quarterbacks never experience in their career. So yeah, you got a little cocky, you got a little arrogant, you know, he started maybe getting a little looser with his throws, but, um, I don't have a problem with a guy like Mahomes throwing interceptions. It's it's when that he throws those interceptions. You know what I mean? Like there's there's a time and a place to to play that style of football. And in the postseason, when time is running out, you're like, no, you need to be a game manager. You need to know the situation. And and he wasn't that. And I think that that was uncharacteristic for him. I don't think that that's going to be the rule for Patrick Mahomes. I think that it was more of the exception. But, yeah, that's something that he's got to consider moving forward. See, I get what you're saying, but I actually think it it has become a little bit of the standard for Patrick Mahomes based on the way I'm seeing it. Obviously, you and I see it uh, vastly different. I feel like he does play street ball a little bit too much, and sometimes he does it, and I guess this is where you and I agree, that he does it in – circumstances that don't call for a street ball type of play. Mm-hmm. So, Listen, but- you don't always have to make the big play. Sometimes it's okay to throw the ball away. Exactly. The, the, the Chiefs are paying Patrick Mahomes to do Patrick Mahomes things, and a lot of times that's the street ball type of play that you're describing. It's like they wouldn't have gave him the amount of money for the amount of time that they would if they wanted him to become uh, Trent Dilfer. Okay? Right. You know, the, they understand – uh, he's going to take chances. They understand he's going to turn the ball over. Yeah, it happens in, in opportune times, but you know what? You still have like one of the best, what, two quarterbacks in the league? Yeah. Y- you deal with it. You know what I mean? Look right. at like Brett just, Favre. Just, used to lead, Brett Favre used to lead the league in interceptions, and he would take teams to, you know, great postseason Super Bowl runs. Like, well, mm-hmm. one, but right. you, you get my point, though. <laughs> the point remains the same. Right. I'm not saying like Patrick Mahomes needs to completely change his style and no longer be like what he is. I'm just saying I think he needs to dial it back. Right. If Patrick Mahomes isn't playing the way that Patrick Mahomes is playing, I mean, then like the, the Chiefs, you know, the, the management, the coaching, and their fans would be incredibly upset because this is the way that they're going to win games is by Patrick Mahomes playing like this. Yeah, yeah. he's got to take – he's going to have to make some – like some throws that are going to get 
turned over. You know, it's just going to happen. It's, it has to happen. He's a, he's a guy that is more successful than not. Okay. Sure. There's a couple of ill-timed plays. That's going to happen when I mean, you play so much and you yeah. play so well for so long that it's going to happen. And, yeah. You know, but it happens to the best, you know, it happens to guys like Brady, you know, he, he had moments where he would. Oh, know. geez. Uh, who remembers after the Eagles Super Bowl when they, all they did was just post a picture of Tom Brady just just short of the the ball on the their version of the Philly special that they ran. I know that was, was brutal. That, was so that brutal. picture got spammed so much. Yeah, so it happens. You know, you're, you're. I agree. That's why I said with a guy like Patrick, you have to you have to come to terms with the fact that like twelve to fifteen interceptions, like he's gonna have to throw that like every year, yeah. just because, yeah. like. To, to put up the offensive numbers he puts up, you have to take risks. You know? Yeah, because, you know, with the 15 interceptions, he's going to have, like, 40-something touchdowns. Exactly. But if if he starts playing conservative all the time, you're going to look at that touchdown number come down to about 25, you know. And then – so I, I think having him throw interceptions is – it's part of it. But, um, yeah, I, I'm kind of right in the middle, Josh. I think that you're right that he needs to rein it in a little bit. Um, but I also think that that's Patrick Mahomes. You know, that's what you're paying him to do. You got to live and die with with that guy. You know, playing to his ability. And that's fair. So let's let's bring it back to the Browns now. After we had that little Patrick Mahomes diversion, uh, Andrew Berry was speaking. Of, it was very non-committal about the future of Jarvis Landry in Cleveland. Not very surprising. Uh, I've seen Andrew Berry speak more than enough times over the past two years. I've, I've seen the way he's phrased things more than enough times over the past two years to know what the writing on the wall here is. And that's Jarvis Landry is not going to be here unless no. there's, unless there's a complete change in discussions internally that we don't have uh privilege to, to read or hear. Yep. I agree with you. I think he's gone. I think yeah. the, the Beckham experiment and how that turned out for him in LA, uh, uh, definitely weighed into his his uh, some of his decision making with some of his tweets and his statements um, this off season. Um, I mean, he he saw a guy get basically he, OBJ was set free and then he thrived, and and he's thinking, okay, uh, I'm a guy that's getting up there in age. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, how many more times am I going to get a shot at this thing? He's got um, probably one. Probably he's one, got, more he's got one shot for a big payday. He's going to have to sign some one year deal somewhere for. I don't know, probably like five million bucks, mm-hmm. and he's gonna, he's gonna have to have a hell of a season to set himself up to get like a five year deal. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's his game plan. It's it... yeah, I think he'd be thrilled if if he can get a five year deal anywhere. I think that he'll be thrilled with that. But yeah, I think the writing's been on the wall since the season ended that. Okay. Uh, that he was going to follow in OBJ's footsteps probably and be on his way out the door. Um, so we should but, draft a receiver. I mean, the Browns need to draft a receiver, sure. But, I mean, if they move on from Landry, you're going to need to fill the first, second, and third receiver spots. With Hollywood right. Higgins? What? With Hollywood Higgins? No. no. Uh, no. He's gone. Hollywood Higgins is leaving. Yeah. yeah. How do you yeah. know that? They're, they're not bringing him back again. They're not running this back again with him. They, they could have got another one year deal with him. No, uh, I want to go. I'm tired. I'm tired of him. Okay. He's not good. This is the this is the what the third coaching staff we've seen like basically be non committal to Hollywood Higgins. I'm, why did I say Hollywood? Rashard Higgins. Okay. There's one Hollywood in this division and it ain't him. There's one right. Higgins in this division and it also ain't him. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's be real here. But like, We've seen – Why is he on his team for five or six years? Who gives a shit how long he's been here? He's not – No, good. what? That part doesn't matter, Church. He's not, do you want another fourth, fifth receiver? Because you already have one in Donovan Peoples-Jones. Do you really need another one? No. Who's our best receiver right now? Currently? Because he's still on the roster, Jarvis Landry. And Dwight right. he's gone? DPJ, unfortunately. Donovan Peoples-Jones. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, you would need to fill in the first, second, and third receiver spots if when they get rid of Landry. David Njoku could be a receiver. No, oh, don't worry, he's on he's on our tops of discussion, and no, he can't. Um, no, he can't lose weight and become a receiver. 
No, he to lose weight. He has terrible hands. Yeah, he's not. A, he's not a wide receiver. Let me look at his stats. He is. His stats are pathetic. Okay, I got into a conversation the other day on Twitter with someone trying to show how unproductive he's been over his entire career. Do you know he's more likely to have zero to twenty yards receiving in a game than twenty-one or more? That's incredible. That's terrible. That's awful. all right. This. Yeah. This season, Especially actually, when you see he's guys like Mark bad. Andrews and Travis Kelsey and all the, you know, Kittle. Like, there's guys over, all over the league putting up huge numbers at tight end. And, and we're seeing, you know, David Njoku with two catches for 19 yards. Yeah. Like, what the hell he, are we he, he, he has four great. touchdowns this season. Okay. And they're talking about paying him to, you know, double, like $10 million a year. Like, it's ridiculous. They're talking about doing that? They're talking about exceeding double digits in yeah. average annual value for David Njoku. And that would be the mistake on top of mistakes, okay? If we're looking at something that's going to age like milk in the hot sun, it would be a double-digit figure salary for David Njoku on this team. That would be the lasting legacy of the Andrew Barry regime after they sign him and they get canned after all of this completely blows up in their face next year. And Njoku is very similar to DPJ. He's a guy that, like – it, in shorts and a t-shirt, like he looks incredible. He's a freak athlete. I mean, combine, he's going to blow you out of the water in every category, but he just doesn't, he can't catch the damn ball and he's not a wide receiver. He's not. And it, it's just crazy to me. And this is part of the problem is that we get guys like him and because he had we've 36 had receptions last, last season. season. So what? Who, Who cares? cares? Go look at Travis Kelsey's numbers. Yeah, oh, uh, George. I was calling Greg Kittle. Thanks, Mark, Mark Andrews. George right? Kittle. Mark oh, Andrews. George Kittle. Division. Yeah, Mark. Go yeah, look at the best tight ends. Okay, he's not one of them. Not even okay. close. Shit. Look at Austin Hooper's numbers before he came here. Okay. Blow okay, David and Joker's Joker's okay. Numbers out of the like water. Average. Shit. Look at even CJ Uzama's numbers in Cincinnati. I mean, yeah. yeah. They're all he better than this. David and Joku, you think he needs to go? Yes. Let, let this clown walk. I don't know what we're doing here. Like, right. why? He is. He is. He has so many bigger issues on this team, and he's a guy we're talking about throwing ten million a year at. It's ridiculous. We shouldn't. He's <laughs> no reason to. I mean, he's a guy who, yes, he is a physical specimen. That's awesome. Okay, but. That's his own downfall. He doesn't yep. have refined skills. He uses his his size to essentially box out and muscle out defenders around him. Okay, how did he, he get four not... touchdowns? And he was mediocre this season. Who cares? People were talking like David Njoku had the season of all seasons this year. Are you kidding? Go, go no, look, no, go his best season Brown was Twitter. his best go season was his second season. Don't pull your hair out in clumps, jerk. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me tell you this: David Njoku is the Duke Johnson of tight ends. Okay. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> he's I'm like really worried about the, the, Ooh. everyone in this fan base and by people that think he needs to play more and get more opportunities. He's just not special. I'm sorry. He's not. He's not. Never has been, never will be. Never we're we're will five be. years in and we're still talking about Raw and developing. What the hell are we doing? People are like, we, we can't let someone else uh, capitalize that. Don't fall into the, the into sunk cost fallacy, okay? Yeah, you whipped on this draft pick. You shouldn't have picked up the fifth-year option. You paid him, I don't know, four times as much money than you should have. Cut your losses and go. Thank yeah. you. Cut your losses. Stop. Stop. In, don't invest more money in something that you don't know is going to turn into anything that's average because he's not even average. He's not good. Yeah, sure, he's improved as a run blocker and pass blocker, but that's only because he was dog shit before. Okay? I remember, James, we're building like an expansion team, though. Yeah. We're, <laughs> we're, and how, yeah. how do we have to play out? Brian, Brian, Andrew Barry's philosophy now. We're building like an expansion team. So, yeah. Do you think that was a lucky season, James? Yes. What, 2020? Mm-hmm. It's an anomaly. Yeah. It's not going to happen again. Yeah. Because, <laughs> jerk, think about this for a second. As soon as that 2020 season happened, what did all the experts say? This team's going to win be win the Super Bowl next year. This team's going to win the AFC Championship, blah, 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 blah. They didn't even come close to that. So uh, I'll, I'll throw this at you too, okay? You look at 2020. You look at all, all the obvious deficiencies that roster had. They did their version of essentially going all in, Okay. 
They added Jadavian Clowney. They got John Johnson. They got Troy Hill. Odell Beckham Jr. was coming back from his injury. They, they got drafted Andrew a quarterback. Walker. They drafted JOK. They they drafted Greg Newsom. Greedy Williams actually played. Okay. Was and it good? They flopped. they flopped so fucking hard. Okay. That should be telling you everything you know about. That's you because OBJ left. What? Because OBJ left. It has nothing to do with OBJ. It has everything to do with the fact that this team wasn't that good in 2020. Okay. Right. You know, there, there was a, a very good indicator that this was going to happen. And it's not it surprising that it, that it did. The Browns had a, a unreal record in 2020 in one score games and it flipped last year. That's how it usually goes. And your record in one score games usually flips from year to year. Okay. And, and, and most of those games we were winning, they were like really close games against bad teams. And we lost to the thing. Jets, too. I mean, yeah, we lost to the Jets. We also had starting wide receiver Jamarcus Bradley. Okay. That, that's we should bring him back. He's on the team currently, but he'll be a free agent and they'll, they'll probably let him go or sign with practice. Are you glad he's on the team? Who? Okay. Jerk, I don't know what the heck. But, but either either yeah. way, the, the, the Browns should not even waste their time with trying to pay David Njoku a lot of money. Okay. No. He's already overpaid as is. Okay. Paying him Baker, more than that would be a complete mistake. What did you say? Baker giving him an extension too. No, we're not doing that. There's no, no way they're doing that. He doesn't okay. deserve an extension to begin with. <laughs> and, let me just say, I'm glad that uh, I was proven right about all of this shit because a year ago, you guys all called me insane for my takes about this team. But look what happened. I told you Baker Mayfield wasn't special. I told you that this team had a very good chance of regression. I told you that you know David Njoku was not going to be that good. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to lie. He, he, he got better. Out. You laid it all out in black and white for us at the beginning of the year, and you kind of hit it all right on the head. So with that being said, uh, I mean, but who do you take with that first-round pick if, if you're Andrew Barry and you're uh, building an expansion team? I'm building an expansion team. Okay. Yeah, if that's the case, I'm going to University of Pittsburgh and taking Kenny Pickett. Bye-bye, Baker Mayfield. Do you think there's a possibility we use that first-round pick on a quarterback? Yeah. I think it's possible. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely do think it's possible. But and on on that note too, we were talking about colleges that guys come from where they don't have success. Let's look at some guys that, that come from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, one in Aaron Donald, who was on the edge of winning Super Bowl MVP. Mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, man, they, they put out some good players, man. Okay. Like they, uh, they do. Uh, you go yeah. a little bit older, Dan Marino. Yep, Dan Marino, of course. A little older, but not too old, Larry Fitzgerald. Yep, Larry yeah. Fitz. He was he was amazing there. He had that streak of like seventeen straight games with a touchdown catch. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Pittsburgh players play very well in the NFL when they get drafted. It's, Forgot yeah. about Darrell Revis too. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Darrell Revis. Point. Yeah, even more. Yeah, and I like Kenny on the basketball He's end. Uh, Stephen Adams. I hate to say it, Pickett reminds me a lot of Roethlisberger in this draft, just in terms of, like, his build and, and you know, like, the, a guy that isn't, like, people aren't crazy high on him, but he's, he's you know what I mean? It, it feels a lot like that Roethlisberger-type player where he can come in and, and be a, a staple in this division for years to come. I like him. I don't know. But yeah, I don't know about other guys, though. That's the problem. Is it's, it's, it's either Kenny Pickett or Bust, if you ask me. Coral, maybe. I don't know. I need to watch a little bit more tape on him. I didn't watch all of his games, but um, I like what I see from Pickett, though. So if he's there, I, I've got no problem with them taking that. I mean, here's the thing, get too, Garoppolo is, too. First of all, I'm, for some reason, I thought Khalil Mack also went to Pitt, but I stand corrected. He went to University of Buffalo, so right. my mistake on that one. Um, Mack school, though. Yes. Not out. So... Um, but the thing is, like, our offensive line, I have a bunch of question marks about it still. So Where? Huh? Where? Just as a, seem, just as a unit more in general, because towards that the end of the season. only issue, though, really, for us as a unit. It was more just health, was it not? It, 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 was, it was health for the most part. It wasn't inability. Um, 
you should, if you want to have questions, there's one player on the entire offensive line that's a question on. This is Jedrick Wills. What is he? Okay. Uh, I think he's probably a league average left tackle. And that's, yeah. that's fine. But, you know, it, you're not going to – he's – out of the five starters, he's the worst starter. I mean, yeah, and that's the most important position for a running team like us, that left tackle position. You, yeah, you rank him fifth among the five. Uh, if you want to have questions, it's, it's if they get rid of J.C. Treader, which seems like it's a very possibility. That's when questions start to open up a little bit. Yeah. Do they go with Nick Harris as their starting center, or they look for outside help? Do they draft yeah. someone? Do they sign someone? Um, if you want to talk about another question, I guess, is Jack Conklin and how much he actually plays this year. Okay. Um, they did restructure his deal, but he had a torn patellar tendon. He could be missed like half the season. So That's a bad injury for a lineman. Yeah. And so if you want to talk about questions, I guess more it's gonna be about Jack Coughlin. It's gonna be about what how are they gonna handle Wills, but until they get rid of JC Treader, I'm not gonna call like the offensive line like a liability or like it's an area where I'm really concerned about their ability to perform. The defensive yeah. line, on the other hand. That's a that's a fucking dumpster outside yeah. of Miles Garrett. Right. I'm not saying the offensive line is like atrocious and needs a ton of work, but I Saw some things from it last season that had me concerned. And, like, I don't know if any quarterback could necess- – there were times where I'm like, could any quarterback really survive behind this offensive line? So that's why I'm, like, hesitant to draft a quarterback. I mean, if they're, they're going to draft a quarterback, this is probably one of the best offensive lines a, a drafted quarterback could be playing behind, okay? It, th- yeah. They're still one of the better offensive line units in all football. A, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the bad signs you saw were when we didn't see the starters in. And while you can't count on your starters for all 16, 17 games now, uh, I mean, how many games do we see Michael Dunn and Blake Hans play? Okay, we had a game where Joel Petonio plays left tackle. Okay. Yeah. We played that position since college. Okay. So uh, offensive line issues, I'm not gonna, not really worried about it. You think uh, we should bring back Alex Mack? He is happy in San Francisco. He's doing good still. He's still doing good. He's, he's followed Kyle Shanahan everywhere pretty much, which is a good career move for him. He's a Hall of Famer. He's probably a Hall of Famer. I'll agree with you on that one. And he'll, they'll say Cleveland. No, he will not. You don't wouldn't want to retire with us? I mean, the NFL Hall of Fame is different from baseball where you don't have guys putting on caps with team logos, okay? But if we're talking about what team Alex Mack is going to want to reference when he goes into the Hall of Fame, it's going to be Atlanta. Mm-hmm. You don't think it's going to be Cleveland? No. no. I he think played that... most of his career here. So? No, he didn't. I think that a guy like Trayvon uh, Walker out of Georgia, uh, defensive end, um, is worth a look. Um, there's some guys in in this first round at what about defense, the Greek tackle guy? Jordan Davis out of Georgia? Uh, I mean that Georgia defensive line was incredible. Obviously, they're going to get some attention, but yeah, there's there's some good like defensive line talent that's going to be available at that position. So I wouldn't be surprised for them to take one of those guys either. I wouldn't be surprised either. I, yeah. I'm with you there. Uh, Chirk, you mentioned, maybe potentially. Uh, it, Chirk, you mentioned the the Greek guy, uh, George Karlaftis, uh, another Perfect. option for them at yeah. 13. Uh, I, I do think what happens with how they deal with Jadavian Clowney impacts that because if they somehow keep Jadavian Clowney, uh, taking a defensive end at 13 would be incredibly dumb. They, okay. yeah. they are I'm extended them another them. year for um, Jadavian. They haven't done that. He's going to be a free agent. Yeah. Um, you sure? I yes. Yeah. I am 100% sure Javian Cloud is a free agent. Um, so, you know, we're, we're we're looking at, I guess, that roster decision. If they have Clowney, they're not going to take a defensive end. No, no. Uh, no. I'm, I'm working on the assumption they're moving on because that's kind of optimis- optimism on my part. Uh, same. Yeah. And, and so – there, there was a report today that they're going to let Jadavian Clowney test free agency in order to gauge his value, okay? And again, things that we've seen the Browns, A, do, and B, say, um, that means he's gone. Yeah. Okay? We've, we've seen this before, okay, where they let someone go test free agency. What's If they're not, like, rushing to go re-sign him, that tells you everything you need to know. They're not going to re-sign him. Right. It, that's what it is. For a max? 
They're not, they're not re-signing him at all. He's gone. He had those nine sacks. That was his best year in four seasons. That was his yeah. healthiest year in And three. we still didn't get to the playoffs. Mm. Okay, so they, they view Jadavian Clowney as like this final piece, this crown jewel for their defense. <laughs> and it wasn't that. They were still an average unit. Okay? <laughs> yeah. And Why did they were, do that? Was he even a good run stopper? He's a very overrated run stopper. He's a very overrated pass rusher. I'll tell you what Jadavian Clowney is. He's good for about two and a half seconds of chaos every play he's on. Okay. Because he gives you 100% energy for the play he's on. And that's great. But sometimes that leads them over pursuing plays. And if he's not going against a very weak right tackle or someone doesn't completely whiff on uh, a block, he's not getting to the quarterback. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's just, that's just the reality. I, I don't think Jadavian Clowney repeats this season again in his career. I don't think he stays this healthy again in his career. There's so much, there's so much data that's, that points in the other direction. Yeah. Right. And he's getting I mean, older. So. And the other oh, thing, too, is he was that – part of the reason I think he was that productive is because he was paired with Miles Garrett. 100%. I mean, that, that has a lot to do with it. I yeah. mean, that was the, the best defensive players played with since J.J. Watt. So – Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're just – I'm looking at this like uh, if you're going to let him go test free agency, I don't think they're going to resign him. I think he's gone. Yeah, yeah. I really agree. Which I'm sure you're if happy. You him, would you say that's a bad Andrew? What'd you say? Go on. Uh, what was your question, Chirk? Uh, if uh, they were to uh, re-sign Clowney for a max. Uh, first of all, there's no such thing as a max deal in the NFL. Uh, one, two. If they did, if they did sign into a very large contract, I'd be very upset for the reasons <laughs> I, I just out. I just. Uh, I just stated, uh, he's not going to say this healthy again. He's not going to be this productive again. There's too much talent in the draft, too, that it's way cheaper. Right. James, I remember your reaction when we were still doing this show, like, in the podcast room at OMS. I we- hated it. I hated it. This, this That signing worked out better than I thought it was going to. I will admit that. I was a little higher on that one, and it was for the reason that Josh just said. He's going to be paired, paired with Miles Garrett. So I did – expect him to produce more than he was you know before he got here but James you're right like everything went perfect for him this year mm-hmm. like that the odds of that happening again are slim it's, it's very not, slim. It, it, he's here's never gonna play better than he did last year you're, you're correct what he did is he did the complete opposite of what I want the Browns to do with David Njoku a couple years ago Jeremy and Clowney then a system the Browns okay he sure you did know, that's exactly what he did. He came in for his one-year deal. He performed at a level he's never going to again. Mm-hmm. Some team's going to overpay him. Yep. Uh, enjoy Detroit, Canadian, okay? Because they're going to pay you a lot of money. And yep. that's what he's already stated is his, like, primary factor is money, okay? Go have fun playing for the Tex- yeah, Texans, but go have fun playing for the Jaguars or the Lions or some other trash team that's going to pay you too much money. Yep. What if, if the Rams get him? The Rams aren't going to pay him that much money. Yeah, they, I don't think they can afford to pay him that much money, anyways. No, yeah. they're, they're yeah. not. or the yeah. Lions. Go, uh, the Lions will have money to have money to burn. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's what that is. Go enjoy, <laughs> go enjoy playing for the the Commanders, Clowney. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean. Hey, that, him, and, uh, to him and Chase Young could be a good duo. They might be. Maybe, yeah. I mean, that'd be a good fit for him. Uh, I think that would be a nice landing spot for him, actually. Yeah, would, but I mean, Connie stays healthy again. I mean, and that's just an assumption that's foolish to make. Also, I have to assume Chase Young stays healthy, too. And if he yeah. goes out and clown yeah. his guy, he's going to start getting those double teams. There's no chance he's going to work through a double team. Exactly. Or, or maybe uh, maybe Clowney wants to go to a tax-free state. Maybe he goes play for the Dolphins. Mm, there you go. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Go play in Miami. Go 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 do the Indomitian Sioux route. Go play for Miami in your late twenties, early thirties, or Jacksonville. Yeah, yeah, ja- yeah, Jacksonville. No, Duval. Don't forget Tampa Bay. They don't have any room, money to sign them. No, Tampa Bay is packed to the gills in terms of luxury tax and all that jazz. Yeah. So I I, I think he's going to go seek a place where there's no income tax. So Florida or Texas or Arizona. Yep, probably. Yeah, probably a hundred percent. Well, I that's, shouldn't say a hundred percent, but that's what I see. That's what I see. Yes, but uh, the topic we've all been waiting for—at least I've been waiting for—is 
in regards to Baker Mayfield, and I've been trying to push the Baker Mayfield conversation as much as possible. Uh, it was on the Athletic Football Show. I don't know if you guys listen to that show, but great podcast to listen to for NFL content. But they were speaking with uh, Charles Robinson of Yahoo Sports about a potential QB carousel. And um, he made a comment about the Browns and Baker Mayfield in regards to if they brought in someone to be competition for Baker. Uh, he said that would not fly, essentially. Like, he would say, I'm here to be the starter. If you're bringing someone else to compete with me, get rid of me. I believe that. He's always yeah. been like that. He was like that uh, in college at Texas Tech. <laughs> he went to Oklahoma. And he's gonna. He's like that now. He's. I totally agree. If so, he's the guy, and he needs he needs that reassurance too because he's soft. Like he needs to know he's the guy. He needs that love. He needs that adoration. Mm-hmm. And if he's not. If it's questionable or he's competing with somebody else, he's gonna do what exactly what we're saying. He's gonna mm-hmm. just say, "I'm not playing." Mm-hmm. Just yeah, trade, trade me or I'm not playing. It's that. Yeah, bad. he's a cocky he's son of a bitch. The whole situation. He is a cocky son of a bitch. Well, yeah, he is. Uh, and let's let's be real here. Has Baker Mayfield really earned the the luxury of not having competition? No. Has has he earned the luxury of uh, a team that has him as their starting quarterback, not looking for somebody else? No, he hasn't. What, whether that's a, a free agent signing, even some of those guys that are bottom of the barrel former draft busts like Marcus Mariota or Mitch Trubisky, yeah, or if they draft a quarterback in this draft, you know what I mean? Trubisky, Trubisky could be good for us. He could be a good fit. I don't think he's anything special, but if that's probably the caliber of guy you're going to get as your backup quarterback, uh, if or a competition for Baker Mayfield, because let's face it, it's competition. Contrary to the people on the internet that are trying to say, just get rid of Case Keenum and have Nick Mullins be the backup. We saw Nick Mullins play. He fucking sucks. Terrible. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, like Nick Mullins? Nick Mullins is awful. Oh. We won with him. Who cares? Nick Mullins is terrible. The Browns, yeah. did, wait. They what? won in spite of him. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's, let's be clear here. Okay. <laughs> Nick wait, Mullins is good. Sure. What game did the Browns win with Nick Mullins as their quarterback? Because they didn't beat the Raiders when he was their quarterback. Uh, I'm checking. You think Case Nick Keenum could be was a the superstar? What? You heard In me. Case... No, I didn't actually. They, they lost the game with Nick Mullins. They were 0 and 1. He went 20 of 30 for 147 yards. Uh, yeah, touchdown. you're right. No, he won one game. Actually, no, wait. No, he did not win a game this year. He was 0 no. 1. No. He I'm not- literally looking at his, his pro football reference page right now. He he was 0-1 this year. Sure. He did not he was not the starting quarterback when we beat Cincinnati in 2018. It was Case Keenum. I was there. I know what the hell I'm talking about, dude. You're right. It was Case Keenum, and I was so hyped about him. I thought he was gonna you be were. the next to uh, and that's because you get like end up- anybody that has a pulse. <laughs> like you, if they have a pulse and they're playing for Cleveland, like you think that they could be the next like the sure. you Bruce Hardkowski the syndrome with the Browns as well. But let's be real here. Uh, you remember him, James? Artist, I remember Bruce Gradkowski. But uh, let's be real here. Like the Browns are gonna have to do something with the quarterback position because standing pats. You, you can't do it. Committing to Baker Mayfield is committing to failure, and you can't do that. Yep, I agree. I would agree. I'm not opposed to uh, bringing in Marcus Mariota. I mean, either are fine. You yeah, know, if it's Mariota or Trubisky, neither guy really moves the needle a whole bunch for me, but it, something. They have to do something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. they can't stand put. The if they do, win. it's a lost season. I mean, we're not going to make the playoffs with Baker. I, I don't think they're going to make the playoffs next year anyways, but that's why. Right. The AFC is way too loaded yeah. anyway. You got Cincinnati. You got Baltimore is going to be back. They're, they just had an injury-riddled season. Pittsburgh don't know what to expect from the Steelers, so they could still be in the mix. I mean, got they're going to be swinging for quarterback. Okay, they're going to be looking for a, a trade for an already established guy is what they're going to be doing. Exactly. Okay. I think so, Garoppolo is a guy that could fit in Pittsburgh well. Garopp- I mean, they could be. They're going to be in the Garoppolo discussion. They're going to be in the Sean Watson discussion. Yeah. Uh, Whatever is going on with Aaron Rodgers, they're always in that discussion. 
Because right. How much he's spoken about how much he loves Pittsburgh. Okay. You know, shout out Pat McAfee show for yeah. all of that content. But yeah, that was hilarious. Any of the quarterbacks that could be on the move, they're going to be in discussions for that because despite the reports and statements, uh, you know, out of Pittsburgh about Mason Rudolph being their guy, he's not their guy. No. That would be a bigger mistake for Pittsburgh. Well, not a bigger one, but it would be on par with the Cleveland Browns staying with Baker. It's just not an option for them. It shouldn't be an option for them. Um, They seem to be high on Malik Willis. I don't know. To me, he feels like another Kyler Murray type player. Um, I don't know. We'll see. But uh, Pittsburgh had a guy um, for a long time in Ben Roethlisberger, and they're going to be looking for that kind of stability and that type of player. I don't anticipate them. I, I don't know. I just can't imagine them putting their faith in a guy like Malik Willis. I think that they're more inclined to go the free agent route or trade and get a guy like Garoppolo or a guy like Aaron Rodgers if Rodgers goes anywhere. Um, but according to Guntakuntz of the Green Bay Packers, <laughs> he says that his phone hasn't rang one time in regards wow. to a trade package for Aaron Rodgers. He says, I call bullshit. bullshit. I call bullshit. So you think it's bullshit. What yeah. do you read into it, James? <sighs> I don't it's know if. Um, if it's accurate or not, but Aaron Rodgers is an interesting individual uh, and there are going to be a lot of teams looking at the the guys in the draft. Uh, Other quarterbacks are going to be available who are younger than him. So most notably Deshaun Watson. Okay. Because I think that's really the domino that's going to set off all the other movement is what happens with Deshaun Watson, uh, whether or not he becomes available to be traded or if that Texans just hang on to him and do nothing because Texans are dumb. Um, I could see them doing that. Yeah, Or if he has the, the legal stuff yeah. that prevents him from playing or if NFL uh, suspends him for an undetermined amount of time. Because even if, again, even if he's not charged with anything legally, the NFL can be like, we're suspending you. Yeah. They had that conduct conduct detrimental to the league rule that is – they can use that on pretty much anything with the way how open word it is. It's it's like a blank check to use that. They can run how they want to. That was their security system that they put in place, and it's been what they've used on guys for a long time now, and I imagine that's what they would use on him if they do go the route of suspension. So, I mean, this is kind of like that weird period where it's the combine. This is really when the discussions start to happen. So – as far as, you know, Gunter Kuntz saying that they haven't gotten any phone calls, it's probably believable because those conversations happen this week. Right. We're Why everyone's call? together at the Combine, hanging out at St. Elmo's, getting some steaks. Yep. Drink, you know, getting completely drunk at the bars in Indy and staying out past, like, 2 a.m. <laughs> With uh, just, guys like Ian Rappaport, that booze bag. <laughs> I, just, I just feel like discussions are – like quietly happening, like maybe I mean, he could have had discussions in person, but his phone didn't ring. He could be he could be not lying about uh, his phone not ringing, but having discussions in person in Indy. Yeah, right. but here's here's he the have a hundred emails. It, it could have been a text message, an email, mm-hmm. or, or a DM. <laughs> and coach, refer- uh, yeah, are coach- you referencing? Are you referencing a a certain Raiders coach? No, no, I'm not representing Raiders coach. I'm just saying, like, these are ways to communicate without the phone actually ringing. Yeah. yeah. You, can be, you can be honest and deceitful at the same time. And, mm-hmm. and I think that's what we're saying here is that he could say, like, oh, well, my phone hasn't rang once. And he could be telling the truth, but he might be a guy that keeps his phone on vibrate. So his phone never rings. Yeah. He's not lying. Half, that's half He's true. not lying. And it's, a, yeah. it's about leverage in this league, you know? So if – if he thinks that making that statement can give him some kind of leverage in there in Roger's situation, um, that's why he's going to make it. So, yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if this is complete bullshit. Um, but like James said, I, I think that it might just be that it's not time for those discussions yet. It hasn't been. It's getting close, but, yeah, it just hasn't been time yet. And I, I think once, that's once the free agency starts. Once we get closer to there, once we see the, the franchise tag uh, window open and close – 
and see which commitments teams make in that regard. Once you see all the other things, because there's no, there's no rush to trade them right now. There isn't. They don't no. need to. Mm -mm. Uh, it, once we get closer to free agency starting, when teams start to make other moves, when teams start to get an idea, when you start pitching to, uh, you know, possible pass catchers as um, who your quarterback might be, that's when those conversations start to happen. Like, hey, we're, we're in trade talks with a certain team in Green Bay about a certain quarterback. You'll be having that guy throw the ball to you, not this bum we currently have on our roster. Right. You know and I mean? then, then conversations with guys like Jarvis Landry are going a lot different. Mm -hmm. Right. So I understand what you guys are saying, but the main reason I'm calling bullshit is because I just feel like we, we've known good and coons to be a liar before. So I don't, at this point, I don't take things at his word anymore. So for me, it's like, I think his phone has rung a couple times. He just doesn't want it. He just doesn't want to admit it and come out and say, yeah, I lied again. I, I think it's more likely that he just hasn't had a phone conversation about it, to be honest. I think so, too. That's probably what it is. It's probably been conversations, but the, again, in person, through text message, through email, through mm -hmm. DM, through one of those uh, those apps where have that messages uh, disappear after 10 minutes. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, it's probably through one of those, not an actual phone call. Yeah. Um, but uh, – Throwing this at you right now before we uh, – I, I saw this on Twitter earlier today, and it said uh, the Browns are plus 750 according to PFF's bet account because they have that now uh, to sign Chris Godwin in free agency. And I'm like, no chance he comes here. What? No. Yes. Yes. No. The only yes. chance he would come here is if Tom Brady was signing with us, and that ain't happening. Chris no. Godwin's coming here. No, he's not. He's no, not going to come here. Because let me ask you this. How... If, you're, if you're a pass catcher, if you're a pass catcher, would you come to Cleveland? No. Yeah. You would want to go from a guy like Tom Brady to a guy like Baker Mayfield. Of course. No. Uh, uh, with, you know, assuming that they don't make a change at the quarterback position, you would go from Tom Brady playing in the Super Bowl to having Baker Mayfield be your quarterback where – we literally just saw him run someone out of town. Then that guy won a Super Bowl elsewhere. I'll make yeah, it look and, good. Uh, David and Joku is your team's leading receiver, also other than you. So yeah, yeah, I, I, exactly I would make him look good. Pointing. That's not that that how it works, bad. man. That's not how it works, Chirk. Yeah, Chirk. That's what? Chirk. That is not at all how it works, my dude. I mean, Chris Godwin's not going to want to come here. He's going to go to pretty much anywhere else. Okay. And I, you know, I, I tweeted this, but let's let's say you're a free agent pass catcher. Why would you talk to the Browns? How did Odell, Odell come to the Browns? He was traded here. He yeah. wanted to be here. It was choice. He was. He it was, wasn't his choice. So, like, like you look at this. If you're a free agent and you're a top free agent, are you gonna come here? No. The the, the guys you're gonna attract are like Kenny Britt, okay, or late career Dwayne Bow, okay. Yeah. Two terrible investments by the Browns, both of them. Okay. Yep. Got, uh, Miles Austin. Awesome. Miles Austin too. The the one year of Miles Austin was fine, but that's because we knew what his role is. It wasn't a starting receiver. He was like the third guy, and that's fine. Right. But yeah. And I also said this: like, if I'm a, a good receiver and I get traded to Cleveland, I pull a grok and say, I retire. Don't trade me there. If you Same. trade me there, I'm retiring. Yep. A lot of guys are going that route. Why don't they want to come to Cleveland? This is a great city. It has nothing to do with the city, Chirk. It has everything to do with the quarterback. They know they're not going to be able to produce. They're not going to be able to succeed, and they'll get blamed, and they'll get thrown under the bus, and then their career is get thrown in the toilet because Baker Mayfield can't complete a five-yard out pass. Okay, that's what they're thinking in their heads. That, that's what their realization is when they're evaluating their options in free agency. Okay, how am I going to make money? How am I going to make money? Not just this contract, but the next contract. Maybe right. what, yeah, eight, what does it look like? What does it look like if I go to Cleveland and it unfolds the exact same way like Odell Beckham Jr. does? And then I get thrown on the trash heap. Okay. Maybe we get Amari Cooper. You guys are looking to what happened to OBJ here in Cleveland and going, yeah, no, not for yeah, me. Yeah, they, they want nothing to do with that. I mean, let's be honest here. Like, Kevin Stefanski's offensive he, system is not necessarily wide receiver friendly to begin with. Okay. No. There, there were issues in Minnesota before he came here. Okay. I know I know there are certain individuals who point to Stephon Diggs' stats, but. Uh, Okay, do you remember him getting upset on the sidelines? Because I remember that happening. Yeah. Do you remember okay. when Adam that happened? Okay. We saw what happened here with you know Odell Beckham Jr. and how it just didn't work. 
okay? Any free agent receiver is going to be very aware of that. If they can pick and choose where they want to go, why would they go here? Especially when they have a lesser quarterback than Stefanski did in Minnesota. Exactly. And James, on top of that, do you remember Adam Thielen? There was a period of time where he was upset with the number of catches he or passes he was getting. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I mean, what do you what do you want to do? I mean, when you have a, a this system, it's not wide receiver friendly. Okay, Easy. then you add in the quarterback who's not very good, and just it's not a great situation for pass catchers, mainly receivers. Okay, if you're looking towards guys, you're going to get you're not going to get anyone special. Uh, I know a lot of people are high on DJ Chark for some reason, but I, I don't get it. I don't know. Um, no thanks. It's just. You're not going to get anyone good. Uh, the only way you're going to get a good receiver on the team is if you draft one. Where it's, it's we'll forget, we'll forget Devontae Adams. We're not going to get Devontae Adams because they're franchise tag him. Yeah, and even if they, even if Green Bay stupidly doesn't franchise tag him, he's not going to go from Aaron Rodgers to Baker Mayfield. <laughs> he'll go like he'll go play for Vegas. Yeah, yeah. with I, Gary Carr. Maybe that's the a better situation. That's what we need. I mean, we need Derek Carr. Oh, he. We're not. We're not going to get him now. No. Yeah, too late for that. Uh, no, He's not but... leaving Vegas. It's too late for that now. We could trade for him. He's not leaving. They're not trading him. We could trade him. The the no. Vegas isn't trading. Derek sure. Carr. Sure. Think of it. I want you to understand this. Josh McDaniels would not have signed on to be the Raiders head coach. If he did not know for he sure that Derek Carr was going to be quarterback, he's not that type of coach. So the Raiders are not going to trade Derek Carr. Get it? Let me just let me just add on to that that point there. Who remembers what happened? Uh, Josh McDaniels' first time around as a head coach, where he ran Jay Cutler out of town. Oh okay. yeah. He did not want to duplicate that same mistake. They're right. keeping Derek Carr in Vegas. Yeah. He lost the team at that moment that he did that. Yeah, he really did. Yeah. Like, there. I mean. He's not going to do it again. He's not going to duplicate that. Uh, Josh McDaniels needs to succeed in Vegas, though, because I don't know about you guys, but I still hold what he did to Indianapolis against him, where he said he would go. Who cares? I don't care. You know what? He probably had information we don't have about what was going on with that roster. You know what I mean? Because yeah, uh, how, how many more seasons did Andrew Luck play after uh, McDaniel's left? One. That's a good point. Yeah, that's okay. Right. And let's be honest here. People like to get, throw that uh, the indie thing against uh, against McDaniel's. If you're gonna do that, throw the New York Jets thing against Bill Belichick because he did the exact same thing to them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. In his introductory press conference, he resigned. Okay. Yeah, Why that's a fair argument, actually. I I didn't even think about it, but now that you mention it, totally valid. And let's uh, – how long ago was that now? You know, let's let's be real here. How long ago was the indie thing? Oh, God. Uh, was that five years ago now? At least. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I do need to move on from it. Four, four years? It, it's it's been a minute. Okay, it's it's not like a year ago or two years ago. God damn, it. Anymore. God damn it, James! Why are you so good at making people change their minds? I hate you. Very <laughs> persuasive. I can't be. I can't. Be. <laughs> No, but, I mean, when you back up your opinions with facts and data, I mean, it is very convincing. And this is one of those arguments that all of the facts and data point in one direction. So, I mean, people still want to hold a lot of the things that went on in Denver against McDaniels. That was 13 years, like 30 old. years old. Yeah. yeah. That's, he was like our age, Brian. Right. He was yeah. He, he okay. was literally our age. And yeah. So, and he went back to New England. He learned a lot. Okay. He grew up. I mean, how much information have you learned in the past 10 years of your life and how much more stuff are you going to learn in the next 10 years of your life? Okay. Right. So think about it and apply that to McDaniels in the way that he's going to approach his second and probably final chance to be a head coach in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
John, when he with him as the head coach in Vegas, he's gonna have to play Denver twice a year. I wonder what that's gonna that dynamic. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. No, I I know he's not, he, 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 I, again, one more thing. Uh Bill Belichick has played the Jets twice a year for twenty two years now. Good point. I'm just <laughs> wondering what that dynamic is gonna be like. That's all. Hey, he, he's not gonna care. He's not yeah. gonna care. I mean, there's gonna be you know Broncos fans bitching about it, and you know they'll have stupid signs, and you'll see them do stuff at tailgates before they play the Raiders. But that's really about it. Yeah, I agree. he's not gonna be like, oh my god, I'm going back yeah. to where I feel as a head coach. That's that's not how they think. That's not how coaches think. That's not how NFL players think to begin with. But that's not how he's gonna think about it. Yeah, right. he's just gonna be like, we're playing Denver this week. Yeah, I think he's got the blinders on right now, and all he's focused on is, is week one. Mm-hmm. And whoever the hell the Raiders play, I have no idea who they're going to be playing. No just, yeah, we'll, we'll find out later what the, when the schedules actually come out of who they play and when. And But, you know, looking at, at them, I mean, I, I think they're a, a franchise going in the right direction. I think so, too. Um, and let me just say, the massive victory lap I will take if – that the Dave Ziegler, Josh McDaniels combo works and has success. And the current version in Cleveland fizzles out like it is on the trajectory to do so. Oh my God. I will take such a massive victory lap. Oh, okay. it's coming. I, I, I I've been sitting here collecting receipts for, for two years now. We talked about this yesterday, Brian. I can be very petty if I want to. Oh, I, I've been, I've been sitting here waiting. Wait, yeah, we gotta, we're keeping receipts. We're keeping the receipts. Yeah, I'm sure. And uh, watching Kyle Shanahan have success in San Francisco and the success he had in Atlanta, I have a couple of receipts myself, too. Mm. I mean, I, I, I'll put it to you this way. A, a year ago, I was advocating for the Browns to trade for Matthew Stafford before he went to L.A., okay? I remember that. I was, I was ahead of the curve before it happened. I'm like, you know what? I wanted, I want them to get Matthew Stafford because I, I realized that Baker Mayfield has a ceiling, and at his best, he's probably Jared Goff. Okay, yeah. I don't yeah. even think he's that good anymore. That's what I thought a year ago. Okay, yeah. And um, you look at the Rams; they they were in the exact same position that we were in. They had a team with pieces on it, and it was win now mode. And it was they made a move. They they moved on from a mediocre quarterback to one mm-hmm. that takes them where they're capable of. And until they made that move, they weren't going to win a Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. And that's where the Browns are at right now. And it's like we just saw it in L.A. Mm-hmm. Like, hello, the writing is on the wall. Like you you. Like they laid it out for everybody to see how to do this, you know. And, and, the, and the fact that Stafford was throwing touchdowns to Beckham, where that would have been, uh, I don't know, here if they would have traded for Stafford, Stafford yeah. last year, yeah. that just was just like that. That confirmed what my 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 wishes, my desires, what I wanted the team to do last year. And yeah, so, this is working. It's not going to work with Baker and OBJ. No, no, no. it's not. I knew right away when we made that trade, I was excited about it because we brought in a star player. But then the more I thought about it, I'm like, wait a minute. Baker's too good to be true. There's no way this is going to work. It, it did. Yeah, and that 11-5 season was very fluky too. You know, there's a lot of lot of things that just aren't – I don't know. It, it, it's a very anomalous season in a number of ways. And, and I think that the numbers don't tell the whole story, but the numbers aren't good either. You know, that's another point I had with like somebody who was like, you know, the numbers in the tape are two different things. Like, yeah, that's true. But when both are bad, then uh, all signs are pointing one way, you know, and I, I just, you, there's no, I, I just don't know why or how people are still supporting Baker Mayfield being this, the answer at starting quarterback this season. I, I don't know how people are entertaining it. Um, and then for Andrew Barry to come out and say, you know, he's our guy. I fully expect him to be the starter day one. And we're planning to build around him like an expansion team. I don't know. I, I don't like that comment. But for, for what it's worth, I mean, the Cardinals did say that same thing about Josh Rosen. Mm, we saw that worked out. Yeah. So I'm I'm already preparing for us to finish in last place this season. And same. Not, yep. Yep. Well, at least we've all accepted it. You know, the the lower your expectations, the higher your serenity level. 
<laughs> and and, and the lower yeah, expectations, they, the lower your expectations, the more they surprise you. For all you know, this could be a Super Bowl team. Oh, oh my God. God. They, they have so much to put this way. They have, they have so many things that they need to address, so many holes that they need to plug, so many positions that they need to get not just starters, but, you know, backups for. When, like, you can't do it in a season, much less two seasons, and this, that's where they're at. When we uh, had that good season, did you think Super Bowl or no? No. No. When we think the Steelers. My high projection for this year before the season started was to get exactly where they were last year, and they even failed at that. Yep. And I thought my oh, were last season my projection was relatively level headed, but with that, we do have to uh, call it a day because it is four o'clock. Yep. So thanks for watching, and we will see you next week. Super Later, Bowl, Super Browns, and that's how we are ending it. <laughs>